Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Raymond Kerr. I'm the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, before we kick things off uh, at, uh, on this uh, sixth annual UAE Security Forum, I want to give the floor to uh, Ambassador Douglas Silliman, the President of AGSIW, to say a few welcoming remarks. Raymond, thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone in our audience, wherever you are in the world. I am indeed Doug Silliman, the president of AGSIW, and it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to AGSIW's sixth annual UAE Security Forum. Um, the forum is usually held in person in the UAE every year. Unfortunately, this year is the second time that the pandemic has compelled us to hold the forum virtually, but we hope to be back in the region in 2022. Uh, inshallah, I should add at the end of that. The focus for this year's discussions U.S. Gulf relations in a changing region covers topics and territory much broader than just the UAE with implications for the security of the Gulf, the Indian Ocean Basin, the broader Middle East, and ultimately the United States. The topics in this forum have been organized to fit within AGSIW's longer term series of writing and programs entitled Refining the U.S. Force Posture in the Gulf, uh, to help put the discussions during the next three days of the security forum into context and to better understand the topics that AGSIW plans to address in the coming months, I would recommend that you read or reread the excellent essay by AGSIW senior resident scholar Hussein Ibish, framing the debate over the US role in the Middle East and the Gulf. That essay, the debate over the US military role in the Gulf is available at AGSIW's website and I will also post it to the chat uh, once we get started this morning. Over the course of the next three days, we will examine with academics, experts, practitioners, and government officials the key elements of how the U.S. relationship with its Gulf partners is changing, has changed, and how those relationships might grow or should grow or not grow or develop in the future. Today, we will hear from a panel of experts from the region who will take stock of regional developments. Tomorrow, a panel of US experts will try to help define US security interests in a changing region. On Thursday, we will cover these topics with Dr. Amr Gargash, diplomatic advisor to the president of the UAE in keynote remarks. And following that discussion, we will explore how the definition of security might be broadened to cover more than just military and geopolitical issues in our session entitled, Can Closer Economic Ties Lead to Shared Prosperity? So sit back, sharpen your pencils, take good notes, and get ready for three days of excellent programs on these very interesting topics. So Raymond, I hand the microphone back to you. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and get started with the session. And um, uh, as, as Ambassador Silliman mentioned, uh, this panel will be taking stock of regional developments over the past year. And we have a stellar group of experts joining us and I'll introduce them uh, very briefly here uh, and share their full bios in the chat with all of you. Uh, I'll start in alphabetical order with my colleague Ali Alfoni, senior resident fellow at AGSIW. Um, he is a political scientist by training and the originator of the theory of transformation of the Islamic Republic into a military dictatorship. He uh, is also the author of Political Succession in the Islamic Republic of Iran, demise of the clergy and the rise of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, also with us is Hassan Al-Hassan, Research Fellow uh, at the Middle East of Middle East Policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. His current research interests include Asian Middle East relations with a focus on South Asia and the Gulf, the foreign policies and economic statecraft of the Gulf Arab uh, monarchies and regional security in the Gulf. Uh, also with us is our good friend Mohammed Baharoun, Director General of Bahuth, which he established in 2002 in Dubai, in the UAE. Previously, he had a career in media where he worked as a reporter of Al Arabi magazine, as a writer for Al Tihad newspaper, and then as an editor for Gulf Defense magazine. Uh, last but not least is Sanam Fakil, Deputy Director and Senior Research Fellow uh, of Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House, where she leads project work on Iran and the Gulf uh, Arab dynamics. Um, her research focuses on regional security, Gulf geopolitics, and the future trends in Iran's domestic and foreign policies. Moderating the session today is my colleague Hussein Ebish, senior resident scholar at AGSIW. He's also a weekly columnist for Bloomberg and The National. And with that, Hussein, over to you. 
Thanks very much, uh, Raymond. This is great. Uh, as, as I keep saying, one of the few upsides of the of the COVID lockdown is that uh, you know being online gives us a chance to routinely get the best panels we could hope for. That that maybe uh, international travel might make more complicated. It solves a lot of problems. And here we have another perfect panel, which is an absolutely ideal group of people um, to discuss this. So um, just to contextualize the conversation for a second, we are. Uh, going to do about 45, 50 minutes of dialogue uh, with the group here, which uh, with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, I'll refer to you by your first names, uh, unless anybody wants, you know, to be called doctor, professor or something, but but I think it's more intimate. Uh, and then we'll, we'll bring in your questions, uh, and I urge you to use the Q&A function um, to submit them. I, I'll I'll then um, send them to the plant, uh, the panel. And this is going to be a, a kind of an unstructured conversational discussion because this is a complicated situation. Uh, I'm going to take a minute to give you a kind of a conceptual framework for how I understand the question that we're asking, and then I will be more of a moderator after that. Um, but uh, I think the idea is that not just over this past year, but long before that, for, for at least 18, possibly now 20, 21 months, uh, the Middle East in general has exited a, a protracted period of confrontation marked by a number of regional conflicts that attracted outside actors directly or indirectly to try to gain advantage strategically in the region through their interventions in Libya, in Syria, in uh, Iraq, uh, in Yemen, and, and in other um, venues in the waters of the Gulf itself, et cetera. And that uh, for reasons that are disputed, um, clearly we have entered into a broad era of uh, what I have been calling for a year now, um, consolidation of retrenchment and maneuver. And what I mean by that, it, by consolidation, I mean these, in my view, the main reason that this is happening, the proximate cause is the exhaustion of actors, their overextension. Maybe some of them are exhausted and some of them are overextended, but all of them bit off more than they could chew, in my view. And more importantly, the battlefields in which they were maneuvering directly or indirectly, in which they were operating through conflict, somehow resolved themselves or passed the point of diminishing returns. Right? There is a victor in Syria. There is something close to a victor in northern Yemen. There is a stalemate in Libya. There is a stasis in Iraq, uh, uh, an equilibrium inside Iraq. There is nothing more to be gained for outside players from continuing direct and indirect confrontation. And given their overextension, I think they've been shifting towards other means. Now, many other people um, suggest other proximate causes, and they're there. There's the Biden administration, which has been pushing uh, for more diplomacy. That's clearly a major factor, plus the ongoing uh, despair about relying mainly on the United States for its traditional allies. That's, that's there. But this does predate Biden. This started happening when it wasn't clear that Trump would be gone. So it's obviously got a deeper cause than that, in my view. There's the COVID pandemic, various economic woes, uh, and a number of other factors that people have cited. I, I stick with it, that the fact that the regional conflicts uh, became uh, non-functional, non-productive for the outside players uh, was the most important factor in, in pushing them towards a different path. Uh, that path, as, as I've said, consolidation, retrenchment, and maneuver, consolidation meaning you try to keep the gains that you have accumulated, such as they are, during the period of confrontation, and give up as little as possible that is essential. But you give up what is not essential because you're uh, you're you're pulling back to to tend to economics. The retrenchment, I mean, precisely looking inward, dealing with your economy, dealing with uh, developing your options, your defense industries, and and getting ready for the time when confrontation reemerges. And by maneuver, I mean trying to uh, consolidate and strengthen your position through uh, non-confrontational means, through diplomacy, through politics, and above all, through commerce. Right? That's what I mean. So 
I think it should be said that there is an obvious exception to this, which is the Israeli-Iranian shadow war, which goes on uh, regarding Iran's nuclear program and various retaliation. It also continues to go on between Iran's militia uh, proxies in uh, Iraq and Syria and, and the Israelis. That is an exception. On that one front, there is no thawing or de-escalation, right? <clears throat> Other than that, though, I think it's quite remarkable. So we're going to look at this phenomenon and try and figure out uh, what is um, a permanent change, a strategic change. There's one obvious example of that, the Abraham Accords. This, no one expects uh, the Israeli-UAE partnership in particular to go anywhere. That is a change that seems to be here to stay. Other instances, such as the, the new dialogue between Gulf countries and Iran, may be more tactical and do not seem to be rooted in a fundamental change. There are many, obviously, underlying causes of confrontation that are unresolved. So having said all of that, let's, uh, let me just begin by getting uh, everyone's overall take on what I've said and what they think uh, about this conceptual framework, and then we can get into more specifics. Uh, let me uh, begin by asking Sanam to uh, give me uh, her response, uh, ladies first, and then we'll go around and, and um, get everybody's basic idea on the table so that then we can have a discussion. Please go ahead. Thank you, Hussein, and uh, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel um, and part of this discussion. Uh, no doubt we've all been sort of following um, your voice in this conversation, and I happen to not uh, disagree with you too much. Um, I, I do see a, a definitive pattern of uh, consolidation and retrenchment. I think the maneuvering, though, um, it is uh, the important point. Um, how uh, durable is this maneuvering um, and how long uh, can it last? Um, I, uh, this, this maneuvering has definitely uh, been important and, and driven by uh, the shift in administration. I'm not sure we would have seen uh, this pattern of, of dialogue uh, that has been multilateral and bilateral um, at a um, sort of level um, that we have not witnessed in the region. Um, Almost every country has uh, been reaching out uh, to each other, uh, aside from Iran and Israel, um, and this has been quite striking. Uh, Egypt and Turkey, Turkey and the UAE, uh, uh, everyone uh, trying to engage in the Afghan um, uh, situation, uh, GCC rehabilitation, Mohammed bin Salman is um, on his uh, Gulf tour, the UAE uh, to Iran, not surprising because it already began um, well over two years ago. Iran uh, and Saudi, the Baghdad talks, um, this is unprecedented. Um, the, the thing that I would find noteworthy, though, is um, that uh, this pattern of dialogue has been underway for two years, or we've been leading up to it for two years. And yet, this dialogue really has not uh, created um, any facts on the ground, anything meaningful um, in terms of outcomes. And this is where I remain concerned and tentative um, about this period of retrenchment, as you describe it, uh, because the underlying and fundamental tensions um, that have uh, driven uh, regional uh, security challenges uh, between Iran and the Gulf Arab states, between uh, Iran um, and, and other external actors in the region remain unresolved. Um, the JCPOA talks in Vienna remain um, on life support, if, if not um, uh, almost with one foot in the grave. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, much of this hedging and retrenchment has been driven by um, the possibility of a deal and the uncertainty of no deal. Um, what we really need to see um, going forward is um, if this dialogue will lead to uh, shifts on the ground. Um, and again, um, my, I guess, opening remark is, yes, there is a lot of talking, um, but how has this really changed? Tensions within the GCC have been resolved on paper, but uh, Bahrain and Qatar have yet to sort of cross the Rubicon. Um, 
GCC states, uh, which are looking to present, as usual, a strategically united front vis-a-vis -vis Iran, are tactically divided um, in how they uh, face off vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. And, and, and that's always been um, a pattern that we have evidenced. Um, and, and so there's, you know, I think we're on the precipice and it, this could very much go either way. It's hinged on Vienna. Um, it's less hinged on Washington, which is, I think, an interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, how the region sort of recalibrates and, and if it can actually translate um, this dialogue into some baseline agreements, not meaningful change or, you know, regional security frameworks, but baseline understandings. Yeah. Uh, I think that's going to really sort of uh, uh, determine which way we are headed backwards or forwards. So the, the, nothing, um, no structural um, framework is, is in place, even informal, right? You're, you're, I think it's a very good point. Let's bring in uh, Hassan and Hassan for a second here uh, as he takes a little sip of coffee and, uh, and ask you to give us your take, uh, you know, just in general. Yeah, thanks, Ibesh. Uh, that, that was uh, green tea, uh, to be fairly precise. Um, I... Um, uh, I think I, I would probably um, argue that uh, the change is uh, perhaps less pronounced than uh, than you might describe it. Uh, I don't think we're exiting an era and entering a new era or exiting a period and entering a new period, largely because I think the strategic picture remains uh, uh, fairly unchanged. Um, I think the rivalries uh, are, are still very much in place, as Salam has described. I would call it more as a, a moment of de-escalation. Um, and I think it's a moment of de-escalation that can be explained partly with reference to the reasons that you described. Uh, I believe you know, the Biden administration is a very important uh, uh, factor driving this. Uh, because I think, you know, that we had reached the point of exhaustion and stasis on many of the regional conflicts uh, well before, in my view, uh, um, any significant uh, diplomatic engagement uh, began. Um, you know, Yemen, Libya, uh, Syria, uh, I mean, these have reached a point of diminishing returns, uh, uh, you know, quite some time ago, I would say. Um, I think beyond that, um, um, Obviously, the, the Biden administration and its prioritization of the GCPOA is, was a very important factor driving this. The 2019 Abbe Khres attacks and the Iranian attacks on maritime shipping in the Gulf, and that was a turning point in uh, the US's traditional role in the region. And I think it has you know, peeled off any, any veneer uh, 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 of a US security guarantee, so to speak. And I think that has prompted a lot of recalculation, a lot of reconsideration on the part of uh, the U.S.'s traditional security partners in the region, uh, the Gulf states obviously uh, uh, being first and foremost. But I do agree. I mean, there is a degree of exhaustion. There is a degree of overextension. Uh, I think the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, low oil prices uh, are also extremely important uh, uh, driving factors that are uh, dampening, I think, the appetite of states to engage in uh, confrontation and escalation at this point in time. But I think it's also very important uh, to look at the different motivations of the various actors involved in this process of de-escalation. And I think the motivations are, are very different. Uh, uh, um, on the one hand, uh, Iran, I think, in engaging diplomatically with Saudi Arabia, um, uh, wants to project a, an image of normalcy, wants to break uh, 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 you know, uh, its regional diplomatic isolation, wants to send the message that it can resolve its problems in its own neighborhood without external, without Western or American uh, involvement or, or presence, and essentially provide the Biden administration with an off-ramp, with an exit strategy uh, to disengage uh, uh, further from the region. I think for, for Saudi Arabia, the calculus is, is rather different. Um, I, I think they view their, I don't think they believe for a second that they uh, hold enough leverage over Iran uh, to be able to change or alter its behavior through diplomatic engagement. I don't think they can believe, I don't think they, they believe that they can change Iran's behavior by talking nicely to it. There isn't much that they can offer Iran to, to, to bring about a real substantial change in Iran's 
uh, regional behavior. But I think they view this as an important tool for managing a difficult bilateral relationship with the Biden administration. Uh, and and why not? I mean, if you know, if the uh, nuclear talks uh, uh, fail and we end up seeing uh, uh, um, significant uh, um, uh, rise in tensions, having a channel with Iran uh, might help contain some of the spillover that the Saudis are, I think, entirely convinced uh, uh, that they will be dragged into uh, if uh, 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 things were to degenerate into a militarized uh, conflict or dispute. So I think, uh, you know, the, my broad takeaway from this is that I, I think the change is, is less pronounced, less dramatic than, than, uh, uh, than, than one might suggest. Uh, and I think uh, I would describe it as a moment of de-escalation. And I think it's very important to be aware uh, that the motivations uh, for the various actors are not standard. They're not the same. Different actors are in it for different reasons. And I think it's important to take stock of that because that then uh, allows us to, to look at the various sort of points of failure uh, that might end up uh, uh, upending the, the entire, uh, uh, what I consider to be a very fragile de-escalatory uh, yeah. process. Oh, it's definitely very fragile. It can can blow up at any second. I think you've raised a great point that we'll we'll take up um, as as soon as we're done, which is uh, you know the, the weaknesses, right? And and uh, uh, how vulnerable is it? But but let's uh, let's keep the discussion going. Uh, Hamad Bahroun, uh, how about you? What are your initial thoughts? Okay, uh, thank you again, uh, Hussein, and uh, it's wonderful to be uh, among friends. Uh, I see a lot of people that I uh, know and uh, glad to have them aboard. Now, uh, most of you have focused on the moving parts, and that makes you wonder, are there some constants in the whole process? And as Sanam mentioned, uh, this has been going on for quite a while. This is not a spare of the moment. So there is some sort of constants. And if I may, uh, provide at least three points I would see as keys to understanding this new uh, strategic map of at least what the UAE is looking at. And to understand that map, those three keys, first one is the geostrategic space. So who we are, where we operate, what is our boundaries. And I think that geostrategic space is the Arabian Peninsula with the four seas around it and the axis of those seas. So it's not only Iran, it's not only Turkey, it's not only Israel, but it's also Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, Yemen, and uh, the entire Indo-Pacific region. So that is a geostrategic uh, space. And if you want to understand why GCC countries, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and others are doing what they're doing, that's part of their identification of who they are, what's their space, What's their immediate strategic uh, interest? The second one is connected. And I think maybe the UAE is doing more than, than, than the others, but it's this connectivity agenda. So the UAE understands that connectivity is a major enabler for stability in the region, but actually stability leads to that connectivity. So if you want to trade between China and Africa and Europe and, and you know uh, South Korea and you need that type of connectivity, which allow for things to move. You know, it allows goods, including energy, it allows people, money, and data. So the more we allow, uh, uh, you know, those arteries to flow freely, I think the more normalization would come to the, uh, uh, to the table. The third one, and I think this connected to all of that, is this view of state versus non-state. So uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, and I think the entire international community wants to focus more on strengthening the states. That's what we see in Iraq. That's what we're seeing in Syria. And I think that's what we're also seeing in, 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 in Turkey. And this is possibly where the connection with, with Iran is going. So to understand, to see those, I mean, if you imagine that you've got one of those uh, you know, augmented reality glasses and you're wearing them to see the region based on those three you know, uh, dimensions, I think you would see more connectivity or let's say sustainability of what is happening rather than the tactical aspect of it. The tactical aspect is very obvious because of those moving parts. And as uh, accurately put, there are so many perspectives. Uh, everyone wants something different possibly from this. But on the basis of it, I think these three major aspects 
uh, makes us understand what we're doing, what we're doing. And uh, yes, I can see how Iran can look as tactical at this point. But if we look at what happened with Israel, which is the same concept, changing the concept of an enemy to a friend and all of the you know, uh, consequences of we have also seeing, uh, sorry, we're also seeing that happening again with, with Turkey. And uh, there is, you know, no reason why this shouldn't happen with Iran, even though I understand there are far more issues with Iran, especially with the state non state uh, uh, denominator. Okay, that's great. We've introduced a whole set of additional ideas that are really important. And let's just bring in my colleague uh, Ali Al Fune to round out uh, the opening ideas, and then and then we'll start looking at the details. Ali, please. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and for uh, providing me with this opportunity to share my uh, analysis uh, with you. Uh, now, uh, I must say that I uh, agree with the fundamental premise that we are seeing tentative signs of an emerging detente between Iran and certain GCC member states. Uh, but I'm less optimistic with regard to viability of, of, of such an arrangement. Uh, and I believe that it is extremely fragile uh, for two fundamental reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, because of the complexities of Iran-US relations, and second, because of the strategic lessons that Iran has learned uh, for the past few years. Uh, the first one uh, with, with the United States is really simple. As long as the Iran-United States crisis continues, and there is no solution to the uh, controversial nuclear program, uh, we cannot expect Iran to normalize relations with the Gulf Arab states. Uh, it cannot be, uh, we cannot have such an expectations because Iran will utilize the threat of uh, attacking or sabotaging the GCC member states in order to have these states persuading the United States to remove sanctions against Iran. So more or less, I am expecting a future scenario in which, yes, there are plenty of contacts uh, you know, between Iran and GCC member states, but every once in a while, uh, Iran uh, does something against the GCC member states to remind the United States that it is capable of playing a very disruptive role in, in, in the Persian Gulf region. So that is very clear to me. Just like whenever North Korea wants to get Washington's attention, they do launch a missile in the direction of Japan, even during the times that North Korea and Japan have fairly, fairly acceptable relations. But North Korea is launching those missiles in order to get Washington's attention. And at some point, at some point, the GCC member states will have enough of it and they will react and then to the escalatory uh, tendencies and, and dynamics that we have witnessed in the past. Now, the second point that I raised is Iran's strategic lessons. What lessons did they learn from the past few years? Well, the first lesson was that Iran may not achieve diplomatic victories. You know, the JCPOA, after all, ended up in failure because of US withdrawal, but Iran managed to score military points. Iran managed to achieve its objectives, strategic objectives in the Middle East region by military means. In Syria, they managed to achieve their, their goal of preserving Bashar al-Assad in power. In Yemen, Iran managed to achieve its strategic objective of denying a military victory to Saudi Arabia and to the United Arab Emirates. This is a huge achievement from, from Iran's point of view. So in other words, their conclusion is, military activity and means are more effective than diplomacy. That's lesson one. Lesson two was that even the maximum pressure campaign of the United States, which definitely weakened Iran's economy, did not manage to overthrow the regime. That is an, a very, very important lesson that Iran has learned. And this has given them a lot of confidence. And the third one, the third lesson that Iran has learned is that short of a land invasion by Iran of any of the GCC member states, like the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, 
the United States will not start a war against Iran. This was demonstrated empirically after the Iranian attacks against the shipping in the Persian Gulf and the Sea of Oman, and after the attack against the oil infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. Because of these three lessons and the dysfunctional Iran-US relations, I do not believe that the detente between Iran and the UAE, uh, or for that matter, any other GCC member state is going to be particularly long lived. And we will go back to a state of conflict. It is only a question of time. Right. I mean, yeah, I, I, obviously the uh, dialogue between Gulf countries and Iran is the, the most fragile of all of this sort of de-escalation that we've seen. However, uh, is there any chance of uh, mutual self-interest um, leading to something uh, more sustainable than the kind of um, uh, gray zone conflict that we saw during the, the period of maximum resistance. Let, let me begin with Sanam and, and see, is there is there any reason for hope or is it as bleak as Ali said and, and I think I suspect? Uh, I, I, sorry to say that I'm a bit pessimistic in this space as well. Um, Sorry, it's a bit of the, you know, facts on the ground. There's an asymmetry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, structural asymmetry between Iran and the GCC states, whether we like it or not. The GCC states cannot deliver or provide Iran with the incentives or the concessions um, to shift Iranian decision making, uh, it's per threat perceptions, um, and ultimately uh, the states or um, international um, community that, that can provide those assurances for uh, the Islamic Republic are outside of the region and don't have uh, the uh, will, focus, attention span uh, to, uh, to get there. So thereby I see uh, the, the dynamics being extremely fragile. Um, and even if um, we can imagine the JCPOA uh, being held together. Um, the, the fundamental um, concern for regional states and, and the GCC states is Iran's role um, in uh, and around the region and its missile program that has proven to be repeatedly destabilizing. Uh, and um, those cannot be unraveled uh, through uh, bilateral or multilateral dialogue. So, you know, the the essential crisis remains. Yeah, yeah I think that's clear. Uh... Muhammad, what do you think? Uh, you know, any, uh, you know, what, what's the, let me ask this, what, what is the sort of a best case scenario uh, from, say, a UAE perspective uh, about this dialogue? And, and what, what would be a worst case scenario? You know, so uh, how does this look in terms of UAE's goal uh, regarding this um, dialogue with Iran, which which the UAE pursued um, earlier and, and maybe more enthusiastically than some of its neighbors? Well, I have to say that the lessons Ali mentioned are very true, very accurate, and I've heard them quite a lot, but mostly coming from the uh, IRGC side. And it validates their point of view, they validate what they are, why they're doing what they're doing. And I think that's that's very, very accurate in, in a sense. Uh, and also, uh, Sanam is, uh, is right. As far as the GCC countries, what can they give to Iran? Uh, mm -hmm. It's, you know, not as much as, you know, uh, what maybe Iran wants. But there's, I think, another element that we need to look at, which is internally. Yeah. And internally, uh, uh, there is a lot of contestation of the actual regime and what it can provide to people. It, its role as a governing, as role as a provider. And I think that is something that is, you know, uh, having some sort of an impact internally. And I don't think any of the Gulf countries are actually looking at any sort of a regime change policy or strategy. I think what we're hoping for is a regime modernization rather than a regime change, where we're pushing the state factors versus the non-state factors, yeah. dealing with Iran as, as another state that we can viably deal with, and they could benefit across right. from. So if they need leverage, they can get leverage. 
but it doesn't have to be through the military aspects. And that's the type of change that is, you know, has not been explored a lot previously. Right. I mean, uh, it's, I understand that that certainly is ambitious, but it would change everything. Uh, Hassan, what do you think? I mean, is there, again, I asked the same kind of question. What, you know, is there anything to hold on to, or is this just a pause leading to another confrontation as, as Ali and, and I think the rest of us tend to think? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the, the Saudis have been saying over the past five to six years at almost, you know, every level of government, starting with the Crown Prince, Had bin Salman, to the Foreign Minister, Faisal bin Farhan, to Abdul Jaber when he was Foreign Minister, and, and so on and so forth, that uh, uh, speaking to Iran is futile, if not counterproductive. Uh, because you end up uh, uh, allowing Iran, you end up legitimizing Iran's uh, actions and behavior, you end up allowing Iran to project or to break uh, out of its diplomatic isolation and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you send a signal of weakness, right? And the idea is that uh, I think the, the premise underlying that view, uh, as, as I said uh, previously, is that there's very, very little the Gulf states can do to change and alter Iran's regional behavior. There's a, a conviction that Iran's regional behavior, its support for armed non-state actors, its proliferation of missile and UAV technology uh, are immovable co components of Iran's national security structure. Perhaps short of expelling all Western and, and American forces uh, uh, from the region, uh, you know, uh, th there's really little that the Gulf states can offer Iran. Uh, and of course that's never going to happen. Uh, there's very little that, uh, um, uh, the, the Gulf states can offer Iran to alter its, its, its behavior in the region. The issue is that, I, from my point of view, I, I, I think the Gulf states, especially Saudi Arabia, are in a strategic predicament. Because the default Saudi mode for dealing with Iran is a balancing strategy. Mm. On the one hand, internally through uh, 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 obscene amounts of military spending, being one of the highest military spenders in the world, uh, and externally through uh, a range of uh, uh, strategic partnerships, be it with the US or through uh, uh, you know, the GCC as, as a bloc. Uh, and so uh, this has been the default Saudi strategy, Saudi mode for, for dealing with it. The issue for Saudi Arabia is that its ability to balance against Iran has been compromised by the changing nature of its relationship with the US, the fact that the US is no longer interested in playing the role of security guarantor, that it has a difficult bilateral uh, uh, relationship with the US. And so I think the Saudis have tried to deal with this on the one hand by buying time through de-escalating with Iran, and on the other hand through uh, uh, attempting to uh, uh, reunite the Gulf states, the, the Arab Gulf states. The Al Ula summit is one example. The Saudi Crown Prince's regional tour is another. Two weeks ago, by the way, uh, uh, the, the, a, a unified GCC military command center was inaugurated in Riyadh. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's not a coincidence uh, uh, that all of these things are, are happening at the same time. I think the Saudis are trying to, to create a more unified GCC block in order to compensate, uh, however slightly, for, for the shortfall in uh, the relationship with the US. But there's also a clear Saudi, I think, uh, uh, desire uh, to on the long term, invest in indigenous deterrent capabilities. Yep. And I think the Saudi investment in missile technologies that's raising a lot of alarm bells in, in, in US intelligence and, and policy circles, mm. the rumored uh, uh, rocket engine testing facility in Al-Wata, yep. or the, the rumored Saudi partnership with, with Ukraine, I think is part of a long-term Saudi strategy of uh, filling in the gaps, uh, uh, trying to reduce the asymmetry, uh, and essentially, ultimately, develop a deterrent capability. The problem is that, you know, and, and, and there, uh, the Americans at, at the IWS Manama Dialogue, for example, and Secretary Austin, uh, was all about missile defense. We're, we're going to help you defend yourself. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to block the punches, uh, but I think it's, it's absolutely essential for the Arab Gulf states to be able to stop the punches from, from, from coming in in the first place. Yeah. So there's a difference between defense and, and deterrence. Uh, yeah. And I think the, 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 the key issue, I think, here for, for uh, uh, U.S. policymakers, I, I think, uh, is to start considering uh, uh, the kind of situation that they're placing the, the Arab Gulf states. 
Because on the one hand, they're not willing to extend a deterrent umbrella over the Gulf states. They're not willing to allow the Arab Gulf states to partner with China, Russia, or other uh, uh, great powers to fill in the gaps in their own uh, uh, capabilities. And they're obviously not willing to allow the Gulf states to develop their own indigenous deterrent capabilities in areas such as missiles, for example. Uh, and so the question is, uh, what options do you leave, do you leave the Gulf yeah. states with? And I think that the Saudis are seeing the strategic predicament. Now, of course, the Saudis are not the only players, and, and different uh, other Gulf states have different strategies for dealing with Iran. The Emiratis are clearly hedging to an extreme, uh, uh, cultivating, you know, inviting the Israeli president and the, and, the, and the Iranian president almost a few days, you know, sending out invitations almost a few days apart uh, to, to, to visit the Gulf states. Uh, um, the Omanis, the Kuwaitis, the Qataris engaging in various degrees of, of, a, of appeasement. Uh, and Bahrain, mind you, uh, uh, adopting a, a strategy of counter escalation uh, by hinting, and, and we've seen we've seen Israeli rumors about Israel being joining the combined maritime forces that are stationed in Bahrain, uh, uh, which are obviously false uh, because the uh, uh, Kuwaitis and the Pakistanis and others will, will not allow it. Uh, but this idea that Bahrain could serve as a beachhead for a military an Israeli military presence in the Gulf region would, I think, be a game changer for, for Iran. So, so there are obviously different strategies uh, for dealing with Iran, but I think overall, there is a, a broad awareness that the Gulf states uh, are in a strategic predicament and, and currently lack uh, 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 any meaningful uh, options for dealing with. Okay, I have a follow-up on that, but I'd, I'd like to, before, before following up on it, I'd, I'd like to ask Ali a, a question. Uh, Ali, uh, I think it's, it's uh, obvious that Iran has wanted a dialogue on, on the current terms for a while. And Gulf states were not engaging. Uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, et cetera, were not engaging with Iran. Uh, and as uh, uh, Hassan and Hamad both noted, uh, said this was, you know, uh, would be a bad thing, that it would, it would be rewarding bad behavior. And, and now we do see that dialogue. So uh, do the, um, the, the more aggressive factions in the Iranian government or the Iranian government as a whole, if there is no real dispute, do they view the fact of the dialogue as a victory? Do they view it as a recognition uh, of a uh, degree of Iran's power and, and uh, the kind of lack of options that Hassan uh, has rather painfully outlined. How do they see this? Uh, thank you for the uh, question. Just you know, starting by going back to uh, Dr. Baharun's uh, very, uh, I think, important statement about the role of domestic politics in, in Iran's strategic behavior, and the bureaucratic politics behind, you know, the strategic decisions that behavior that Iran is displaying in the region, uh, it, it's really important, yes. Uh, but the IRGC is not just, you know, calling for military action because the IRGC is also an economic player. So the organization of the IRGC is far more sophisticated than just, you know, people using guns and, and, and launching missiles. Uh, and, 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 uh, but I'm also expecting that they will be making demands, especially from the UAE, which would be very difficult for the UAE to accommodate, exactly because of the IRGC's economic interests. Uh, they would be trying to ask UAE uh, to have uh, economic activity in UAE, to use the UAE financial institutions in order to trade with the world, uh, to, to engage in economic development of the UAE. And, and then UAE needs to, to find out with itself if it wants to help the IRGC evade and bypass US sanctions uh, and protect itself against potential future attacks of the IRGC. Uh, or, or what it, it's, it's trying to do. So, so, so the game is slightly more complicated, but yes, I totally agree with Dr. Baharun that domestic political considerations obviously also shape uh, the uh, behavior uh, abroad. Now, uh, the, uh, I think one of the keys and, and one of the solutions that the IRGC member states have already found in future competition with Iran is that, well, uh, they try to compete in the military field, you know, and, and, and proxy warfare, you know, with, with Iran. Uh, those experiments were not particularly successful, but the GCC has economic muscles that Iran has not. In other words, when the GCC member states try to invest in Iraq, they will be outcompeting 
IRGC owned companies and in general Iranian companies. When the GCC member states try to normalize relations with Syria, that too is a very serious threat against the IRGC dominance of certain sectors of the Syrian economy. So in, in the future, uh, I am not just looking at a scenario in which there is a military confrontation uh, or Iranian military aggression against the GCC and non-response from the GCC in the short term. What I'm also uh, expecting is intensification of the economic rivalry between Iran and the GCC member, GCC member states in countries which are currently politically dominated and militarily dominated by Iran. Uh, Lebanon, you know, may not be a particularly good case right now, but in the future it may be, be a good case again. Uh, Iraq and Syria are two other obvious cases. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me do my little follow-up to, to Hassan for a second, and then we'll bring um, Hamad and Sana back in. Uh, Hassan, we're, we're in a situation where it would appear that the JCPOA, as Sunnan said, is, is moribund, if not, you know, three quarters dead. Uh, the talks uh, uh, don't look like they're going to produce anything. And so everyone's going to kind of uh, go through the motions for a while and uh, do a kind of blame game to try to convince Russia and China that it's the other side that's at fault and, and gain some advantage that way. But it, let's assume <clears throat> that there's not going to be uh, a, a new understanding in the next uh, year between uh, Tehran and Washington, right? And that Tehran continues to uh, move in the direction of nuclear weapons status. Then surely we will be looking at uh, perforce a new regime of containment, right? I mean, that's obviously the, uh, the, the alternative. Under such circumstances, is there not the possibility that Washington might, in that context, provide more of an umbrella uh, in terms of, um, you know, not security guarantees, but but sort of um, a kind of um, almost treaty-like arrangement with GCC countries or a statement that the U.S. would regard uh, from now on, something like Abkhaz and Khres, which was an inflection point, to be you know completely unacceptable, and uh, would respond uh, you know forcefully to that. Not not maybe a murky uh, maritime incident, but something like that inflection point, uh, Abkhaz and Khres. What do you think about that? That's a really um, uh, grim, if, if interesting, and, and thought-provoking. Uh, uh, scenario that, that, that you draw there, Hussein. I mean, I guess there are uh, potentially parallels to be drawn with, um, as, as Ali has, has done with uh, Japan and South Korea, right? where the US uh, steps in to, uh, uh, by providing a, an umbrella, partially in order to uh, uh, prevent a, a nuclear proliferation cascade in the region. Exactly. Uh, which I mean, the Saudis have um, you know stated time and time again that they will seek to be on par with Iran mm -hmm. if Iran uh, decides to to break out. Yeah. Um, now, uh, that's a serious, I think, uh, statement of intent, and it needs to be taken seriously. Even though how Saudi Arabia gets there is is a whole other issue because uh, uh, of uh, the fact and the likelihood that. Um, you know, the big players are unlikely to, to uh, make it very easy for Saudi Arabia to go down the, the nuclear route. Uh, but still, I mean, you know, might the U.S. Um, consider extending an umbrella over the Gulf states? And, and, and would that be enough, uh, so to speak, to solve the, the, the Gulf state strategic uh, predicament? I think it solves yes and no. I would say yes, because obviously it responds to, it, it obviates the need for Nuclear prolifer for, for nuclear prolifer proliferation and for uh, attempting to keep uh, pace with Iran on the nuclear front. And that obviously uh, 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 prevents the Gulf states from taking a, a route that uh, is very different to the one that they've uh, taken now with respect to international norms and, and where they fall on, on international nuclear norms. But it also doesn't uh, solve the, 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 the Gulf states' strategic predicament. Uh, because uh, uh, partly because of the fact that for the Arab Gulf states, while Iran's nuclear program is obviously a priority and is a source of threat, it's not necessarily the most immediate priority. And it's not necessarily the most urgent or even perhaps the most important one. Partly because, I mean, uh, you know, for the, the, the technical reason that 
using a nuclear weapon on, on any of the Arab Gulf states is likely to have severe blowback effect, effects on, on Iran in, in one way or another. Uh, and so the point is that I think even with some form of U.S. umbrella or guarantee that is geared specifically on the, on the nuclear issue, I think the U.S. would still not want to be, because of domestic political reasons largely, would still not want to invest uh, significantly in countering other aspects of Iran's regional behavior that the Arab Gulf states consider to be a higher and more urgent and immediate and concrete uh, uh, security priority, namely Iran's uh, um, uh, support for armed non-state actors, uh, proliferation of missiles and UAVs, and so on. The issue, I think, uh, from the from the Gulf states, the frustration with the U.S. position and, the, and U.S. policy, mm-hmm. is that the U.S. says that it uh, that the that the nuclear and the non-nuclear issues are separate, but it doesn't act as though this were the case. Right. The Iranians act entirely on that basis. Mm-hmm. They'll negotiate on the nuclear side. They'll you know they'll conclude the 2015 JCPOA, but they'll go full throttle on missiles and, and on Syria and on and you know any other regional conflict of your choosing. The U.S., on the other hand, won't respond to to an attack on U.S. forces in Banff, at least publicly, uh, 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 implicitly, I believe, out of fear of jeopardizing uh, uh, the nuclear track and and the nuclear negotiations with Iran. And so, you know, whereas Iran acts on the the basis that these issues are separate, the U.S. doesn't. And I think the Gulf states see this. In fact, I think, ironically, the, the, the U.S. now, and we've heard this from Rob Malley uh, uh, at the Manama Dialogue, the U.S. is explicitly now asking the Gulf states to tie the regional de-escalation process, to tie their own regional dialogue with Iran to the progress of the Iran nuclear talks yeah. uh, and to the progress of the international negotiations, but not the other way around. Right. So the U.S. has always said that they, they are not going to tie the nuclear talks with anything regional. Right. But they're now asking the Gulf states to tie their own bilateral regional relations with Iran uh, uh, to the ceiling of the progress of the nuclear talk. So yeah. in essence, the U.S. is now a potential spoiler of yeah. regional de-escalation and of the de-escalatory process. Between hey, let me let me just Iran throw something out there, though. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. But uh, that's all a really good description of the current uh, arrangement during this effort. Uh, of the past year to revive the JCPOA. If the U.S. Do, you know, uh, comes to the conclusion that that's simply not going to happen, those uh, calculations change. An attack on something tough is, is, is not going to be um, not responded to because of the negotiations. They, they may or may not respond, but it won't because of that. Again, the pressure on Gulf countries to do this linkage uh, only makes sense if you're I don't know, actively pursuing a dialogue with Iran. So I'm just throwing out the, the fact that, again, uh, when Washington, when and if Washington concludes this is just not going to happen with Iran at this point, then a lot of those calculations change. I want to take your point. And I mean, they, yeah, you might still get the same behavior rationalized on different grounds, right? But, but uh, the, the logic falls apart. Uh, I want to um, throw your observations to Sanam and, and to Muhammad and, and ask, um, you know, what happens to de-escalation in the context of the collapse of these talks, of, of the US and Germany coming to the conclusion, others that this Iranian regime is not serious and is not willing to go back for compliance for compliance, but they want something more and they're not gonna get it and therefore, so let's begin with some of What do you think that does to the overall climate, especially between Arab states and Iran, but also the US? Thank you. I think that's a really important question that we have to consider. I, if you don't mind, I just want to go back to something that Muhammad brought up earlier. Absolutely. Um, and then I'll circle back to this, I promise. Um, but he brought up this point, which I think it, it's important to discuss, and I don't have the answers to, but this assumption that the Iranian state um, does want to deliver to its people and that it is unhappy with the status quo. And I think it's worthwhile considering and maybe challenging our assumptions that perhaps the Iranian state is fine with the status quo um, and that uh, it doesn't need to deliver uh, higher levels of GDP growth 
to the Iranian people. And that uh, managing uh, Iran today uh, in a delicate balance between um, managed electoral outcomes, managed repression, and a managed economy is what is working for the Iranian conservative establishment. And if that is indeed the case, and I'm not saying that that is 100% um, uh, a strategy being employed and, and embraced by uh, the Iranian state or what I call the Iranian deep state, but if that is the case, then what can the GCC states and particularly the UAE offer Iran if growth, governance, accountability, um, and visions are not on the Iranian uh, table today? Um, I think that creates a sort of uh, dilemma uh, in, in what Iranian leadership actually wants and what uh, others can deliver for Iran. So I just put that out there as, as, as something that I've been thinking about. And I think it's worthwhile considering also as we constantly um, consider this narrative that sanctions relief is going to change the environment in Iran per se. But to turn it's it back to your- It's a great point. Well, well, just let me say it's a great point to ask what, what really are the priorities of the ruling faction? That, that is an excellent question. We assume one thing, but you uh, please go go ahead. So, I mean, I personally think they want survival and I think that Iran is in a period of transition. And so changing things up too much is maybe not in the establishment's interest. So management um, of regional dynamics, international dynamics and, and domestic dynamics are working, maybe not working within the parameters um, uh, that is considered acceptable in Washington or Berlin or uh, in countries in the region, but working from maybe uh, uh, some uh, some people's perspectives in Tehran. Um, so putting on that hat, I think, is useful. And then in the what context if, of yeah. the, yes? No, what, what about uh, a post-JCPOA environment? Yes, so post-JCPOA, I think, is, of course, uh, the real um, I interesting dynamic to sort of pick apart. Um, you know, as as you know, we might be on the precipice months away from being in a post JCPOA. I think the avenue is such that um, Iran will eventually return uh, to uh, escalation. I think to 2019 is inevitable, and already we have seen patterns of Iranian escalation that are being ignored or. Um, I haven't counted the number of attacks we've seen around the region. I've been meaning to, but we're all a bit busy. But there have been attacks and Iran has been upping the ante. And um, uh, the international community is perhaps fatigued, focused on uh, domestic challenges, trying to prioritize the revival of the JCPOA and thereby um, putting uh, regional issues in a box, but um, Iran is going to continue to up this ante. It, inevit it's inevitable. Um, it's the only strategy to address uh, the issue of the nuclear program. And therein sort of puts, I think, the GCC states that are not unified on Iran, that have tactical differences in how they manage uh, their uh, Iran portfolio in a bit of a bind. Um, I think that the Iranian regime is coming out of maximum pressure, feeling very resilient and, and confident, perhaps too confident, if you will. But they, I, I think the sense in Tehran is that they have everyone, you know, two moves away from checkmate. And so thereby, regardless of what happens with the JCPOA, um, the dialogue uh, is in everybody's interest to prevent uh, what you described um, as a, a turning point in September 2019, Upgabe, or in May 2019 in, in the, the port of Fujaira. So, uh, you know, it's this delicate um, uh, balance that is going to be hard to preserve regardless of Vienna, but uh, Vienna remains sort of the linchpin to building on the pattern of de-escalation as well. Okay, great. Uh, let me just say before we uh, bring in Muhammad on this, um, we are going to start taking questions uh, very soon. And uh, so please submit them via uh, the Q&A function or I suppose chat, but Q&A is better. Uh, Muhammad, what do you think? What, what, what the, the, the apparent imminent failure of efforts to revive the JCPOA and, and sliding into some kind of protracted period of, of diplomatic stalemate, what does that do? 
uh, to uh, all of this de-escalatory uh, atmosphere that we've been talking about? Uh, well, uh, if we ask ourselves, can uh, regional cooperation happen without JCPOA or not? I would possibly look back at periods before the JCPOA, during the Khatami Rafazanjani time, and there was a lot of cooperation on that, and we did not have JCPOA then. Uh, so, uh, but is a collapse of JCPOA help things? No, because JCPOA was supposed to be part of a confidence building measure where people can give enough uh, or can have enough confidence in Iran upholding its part of the deal, let's say, uh, uh, allowing, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a believer that JCPOA can actually lead to non-proliferation at all. It's, in, in my views, it's the opposite. It legitimizes a level of, uh, of enrichment, which should be available to everyone. That is not, you know, helpful for non-proliferation as much as a, an enrichment zone in, in the region. But I think we're, we're beyond that. And if the JCPOA fails, which means, you know, you know, I think uh, uh, Iran does have this at the back of its mind that what else does you know, the, the international community has in, 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 in its arsenal. And on, on the table, there is nothing put under the table. We've also have seen a number of attacks on Iran. Uh, and there has been uh, unnamed culprits, if, if you want to say. Uh, but then these attacks do happen and it does affect uh, uh, various issues. So I can see that, you know, even if we don't have a GCPA, there is a chance for collaboration. It's going to be extremely limited because if it does not have enough confidence in any type of a transaction, including an, an international deal, there will be less confidence in, in bilateral uh, you know, uh, transactions. But uh, also on, on, on Sanam's point on survival, I totally agree. That's what the regime wants. But again, that is part of its survival. It's part of its survival in the 21st century is to change how it does things. Because honestly, I don't know if legitimacy can be observed other than you know with, with security means if uh, it does not change the way it, it does things. So it is about regime survival and end of the day. I would I would invite the audience to begin asking questions from uh, uh, using the Q and A um, function, which would be great. Um, also, uh, I'd like to to throw out a slightly different question, which is which has to do with as we start to accumulate questions on Q and A. We've been focused on GCC Iran dialogue because it's very very important, but there's a, a maybe more substantive. Uh, more structurally uh, meaningful dialogue and, and more than a dialogue, right? Um, actual arrangements being made between, uh, say, the UAE and Turkey and a potential thaw that I, I think clearly is on the horizon possibly between uh, Turkey and uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, this is partly a function also of the um, kind of reconciliation within the GCC uh, between the boycotting states and Qatar, and also arguably um, a, a function of a whole bunch of factors that I'm, I'm not necessarily going to get into here. But uh, let me ask Hassan for a second. Um, how, I mean, it, 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 we've been very pessimistic about GCC Iran dialogue. Uh, I, the, the dialogue uh, with Turkey uh, maybe has a little bit more uh, space to become institutionalized and meaningful, right? And uh, maybe not. So I'd like to ask your views on that. And maybe in the conversation, we can tease out some of the, uh, some of the details. Thanks, uh, Hussein. I mean, before I address that, I, I wonder if your patience would allow me to just address a, a point that uh, Hamed made earlier. In this sure. Since this is a conversation, might as well, right? Um, and Hamed mentioned the, the point uh, that you know there was uh, uh, cooperation uh, between Iran and the Arab Gulf states, even in the absence of the JCPOA with previous under previous administrations, such as you know that of Rafsanjani and Khatami. Um, the the issue is that I mean you know we had. 
a, a multiple security arran uh, arrangements and agreements, you're absolutely right, between the Saudis and the Iranians in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, with the late Prince Nayef and Hassan Rouhani and, and others. Uh, uh, um, uh, there were heads of state uh, visits at the head of, heads of state level, even until the, the, the era of Ahmadinejad, right? I mean, the heads of state visits stopped in 2011 and 2012. And, and King Abdullah had paid visits to, uh, I think the, the, uh, Ahmadinejad had paid visits part in Saudi Arabia. He, 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 was, he was invited to the GC summit in Doha and so on and so forth. Uh, the issue is that, and, and you know, what happened over that period of time? Uh, despite these security agreements, despite the high level diplomatic engagement, Iran arguably made some of its greatest advancements on its nuclear weapons uh, program under reformist uh, administrations. And during that period of high-level diplomatic engagement, despite all of the security agreements that were signed, uh, Iran you know, dominated Iraq by exploiting the, the collapse of the, of the Iraq state and ended up building a strategic corridor uh, uh, during that period when there was you know, high-level diplomatic engagement at a much higher uh, level than, than we see today, uh, built a, a, a strategic corridor stretching from Afghanistan to uh, the uh, Syrian and Lebanese shores of the Mediterranean. So my point is that you know, diplomatic engagement with Iran, the presence of uh, cooperation on, on one level, would, does not necessarily have a, a meaningful uh, material impact on uh, Iran's regional behavior on, on another level. To, to, to address your question on uh, Turkey, which is sort of the other regional player with whom uh, we're seeing a considerable amount of de-escalation, it's interesting. I mean, I think we tend to be very... Uh, uh, we tend to have short memories when it comes to uh, uh, Turkey. Right? Ten years ago, the conversation about Turkey's regional role and, and what role it could potentially play, even in the Gulf region, was very, very different. Uh, uh, you know, the Istanbul process, uh, you know, if that rings a bell uh, to, to anyone. Uh, uh, you know, Turkey was seen as a potential you know, a NATO uh, uh, ally, a NATO member state that could play a bridging role, that could play an auxiliary role in a regional security architecture in the region. And not more than 10, 12 years ago. The Arab Spring obviously changed things uh, with Turkey's support for the Muslim Brotherhood. Turkey was on the other side of, of a number of conflicts. But I think here's where, where I, I agree with your original sort of description of, of regional events uh, saying when you say that, I think here at the point of, of status, reaching a point of exhaustion, a point of diminishing returns on many regional conflicts uh, uh, has obviously, I think, had an effect. Um, uh, Turkey's, I think, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, needs, uh, the, you know, the, the state of its currency, the state of its economy also don't provide it with a, a lot of latitude to engage in uh, regional adventurism. And, I, and so I think the de-escalation serves uh, uh, interesting purposes there. But I think there are, you know, it is a less problematic and perhaps a less fraught process than the Iranian, than the one involving Iran. But there are points of weakness as well. And so the UAE, for example, is cementing its, and, and so Saudi Arabia, cementing its security and, and defense cooperation with Turkey's uh, adversaries and rivals in the Eastern Mediterranean, right? Uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, the military cooperation with Greece, the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, and the role that uh, 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 the UAE uh, plays in it, the exchange of Patriot missile batteries and the deployment of, of, of US and Saudi fighter jets in, in Greece uh, at different points of time. I and mean, this is still a dynamic picture that could end up uh, 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 upending uh, yet another uh, 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 de-escalatory process. But, but I do agree. I think it is a less problematic uh, uh, relationship. Uh, and I think, you know, with, with a longer view that looks at these dynamics, you know, maybe a decade ago, I think these issues are not beyond uh, um, actors' ability to, to, to the ability of the different actors to resolve them and really bring about a qualitative uh, shift in the relationship. Okay, L let me uh, ask uh, Mohammed if he has any thoughts on Turkey, but also, we have a question from the audience, and uh, I'll just I'll ask you and see what you think, and and then if anybody else wants to. Comment. The question is: Did Sheikh Tanun visit Iran as a signal to the U.S. and Saudi Arabia because of current problems, or is it part of a long-term UAE policy of constantly talking to Tehran even when things are going badly? 
So I'll ask you to address that. And, and then if you have any thought, if you want to, and if you have any thoughts on uh, Turkey, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, um, first the question on, on uh, Sheikh Tahnoun's visit. I think that visit has been sort of made known back in mid-November. Uh, it's not surprising. So I think there has been avid time for a lot of consultations with number of, of, uh, of uh, friends and allies. Uh, I doubt that it is carrying a message to Saudi or to the US. I think it's possibly carrying a message from both of them rather than to them. So uh, I think there is, uh, we, we've seen a lot of coordination on a number of issues, and I think that is uh, definitely one of them. On Turkey, and I take uh, Hassan's point about the 10 years uh, back, but before the 10 years back, I think Turkey was different before the Arab Spring than it has you know, become after the Arab Spring. And I think what we see now is sort of a return to the original Turkey that we've known, the Turkey of the, the you know, the uh, uh, excellent economic model, the Turkey of the zero uh, problems with, with neighbors. It's that Turkey that sort of lost its way and possibly coming back. It provided something that people looked up to, and maybe it's going back to that. I, I think that's uh, something that we, uh, need. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of trying and dig into what people intend to or not intend to do, but I think there are uh, some encouraging points. Uh, and I think that's what we do. We enable change if we can. And then whether it happens or not, that's something else to do. But that, that's the point we're uh, working on. Okay, that's absolutely great. Um, let me... Uh... Let me throw out another issue uh, that uh, anyone is is welcome uh, to address, which is uh, there. How ultimately can the uh, region and the GCC states and others deal with the question of non-state actors, which everyone has raised? Uh, and I'll begin with Ali. Uh, you know, is there any formula for dealing with this? Because it, it does make um, any kind of regional framework based on uh, kind of uh, state state sovereignty uh, very difficult to achieve. Uh, well, the, you know, Iran's use of proxies is not, you know, only something that we have witnessed during the Islamic Republic, even during the Pahlavi era. Iran very actively and systematically used non-Iranian proxies uh, to attack and coerce its uh, adversaries. Uh, from 1961 to 1975 Algier Agreement, Iran fought a secret and stealth war against the Iraqi state uh, with the help of Iraqi Kurds. It was uh, more or less the same groups as today and the same families and same individuals, the Barzanis and Talibanis, who were engaged in their own war against the Iraqi state in Baghdad, and Iran supported them. At times, uh, Israel and the United States helped Iran's efforts uh, to uh, uh, fight uh, the central government in, in, in Baghdad. So it is a part and parcel of Iran's defense doctrine. Uh, so I'm not expecting uh, the uh, regime in Tehran, be it uh, the Pahlavi regime, the Islamic Republic, or even a successor regime to the Islamic Republic to change it, its defense doctrine, because it is obviously so effective. Now, if we look at next door, uh, Iran's neighbor, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan has engaged in a war, a proxy war against the United States uh, since 9-11 and managed to win that war, managed to prevail in that war, by arming and systematically supporting the Taliban militia group. So in other words, and, 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 and the US, by the way, ended uh, leaving Afghanistan. Uh, so in other words, it is such a successful and effective means of war that most states do not want to uh, do away with it. It is part of the defense doctrine and it's likely to continue in the future. The big difference that has happened between, let's say, uh, the beginning of the Islamic Republic in 1979 and early 1980s and, and today is that back then, sometimes proxies even managed to manipulate the Iranian state. For example, you know, giving you some very good examples, the Kuwaiti Shia would be sending some representatives to Mr. Khomeini 
and say that, you know, you won the revolution in Iran. If you just give a word issue a fatwa, we can overthrow the Kuwaiti monarchy. The Iraqi Shia did the same thing. And they actually managed to have great influence among the revolutionary leadership in Tehran. Uh, nowadays, the situation is different. The proxies cannot influence the top of the pyramid of decision making in Tehran. They are instruments in the hands of the central government. And that model is working out extremely well. And at the same time, apart from this being a part of you know, the doctrine, the military doctrine, defense doctrine in Iran, it has also become so institutionalized that it is more or less impossible to, 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 to remove it from, 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 from the state. There are people who are paid. There are people who are living the life by being proxy members. There are a lot of Iranian uh, commanders who make a living commanding the non-Iranian. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's institutionalized in, in Iran and regionally and vertically integrated with some exceptions uh, to an, an extraordinary extent. Sanam, what do you think? What's, what's the, what's the long-term prognosis here for that? Well, I think Ali gave an excellent overview of Iran's instrumentalization and use of non-state actors. I, I mean, I, I think we should also broaden um, the aperture and, and consider that Iran is not the only state um, that uses non-state actors. And in fact, the region writ large um, has uh, uh, pursued similar strategies in, in oh, conflict. But, but but Iran, I mean, there is there any equivalent to the IRGC Quds Force anywhere else in the region? There, in other words, it's it's Iran's primary tool for yes. power projection, and I think that maybe is unique. Yes, you're right. That's unique. But uh, we have seen over the past 10 years, regional states supporting non-state actors in countries outside its borders to extend, pursue, advance their policy interests by no means um, to with the degree of uh, strategic coordination if not a success as the IRGC. Um, but of course, those patterns have, have been observed. And we've also seen retrenchment away from those policies, perhaps um, uh, within the same framework that you've laid out with a recognition that those policies are um, not productive uh, or for these states. Um, but nevertheless, um, Iran, uh, while pursuing this strategy, has also put itself, I think, at, at the same time in a precarious situation because uh, it is uh, a predatory power beyond its borders. And there has been very clear opposition to Iran's presence uh, throughout uh, uh, the countries where uh, it is visible, specifically in Lebanon, uh, in Iraq, um, also through the protests and, and electoral outcomes. And I'm sure over time, uh, we will see equal reaction um, in, in Syria and, and Yemen. Uh, but how we address that, I think, is uh, by empowering those states and, and those that process of empowerment is so um, uh, difficult to conceive and requires so much um, investment um, that uh, engaging uh, again um, in, in dialogue on, on Iran's uh, uh, support for um, non-state actors and proliferation of lethal aid outside of its borders, um, that it seems almost intractable, harder to resolve uh, than, than many of the other issues. And I think this goes back to the issue of asymmetry to to resolve um, Iran's existential uh, security or insecurity challenges, um, that has to come a from within the Iranian state and from Iran's uh, perceptions of security, which are particularly, of course, uh, directed to the United States. And I'm still not convinced that the Iranian um, system is seeking to resolve those issues. Yeah. And again, the question of priorities you raised before, very important. Uh, I'd like to shift because we're, we're running out of time and there's a very important question that I'd like to um, uh, throw before uh, Muhammad and Hassan especially, but everyone else too, which is, Looking forward, we described the situation, we kind of chipped away at it. It's a very big, complicated uh, strategic landscape here. But based on the, the kind of uh, situation that we've sketched out, how do we conceptualize U.S. Gulf relations evolving in the coming years uh, based on these realities and, and the perceptions that we've been talking about. Uh, and I'd like to begin with Mohammed, if, if you don't mind, if you 
really want to talk about any of the other things that we've mentioned, that's fine. But I, I would love to focus as uh, towards the end of this conversation uh, now on, on uh, how the U.S. Gulf relationship is going to go forward, uh, you know, balanced with all these different things. And of course, the question of, of, of China's increased engagement as well, BRI and stuff like that. Uh, okay, uh, I think the, the view that is shared across the region is that we're pretty much living in, in this multipolar world, uh, world order. And in that multipolarity, you need to maintain, you know, sort of a balanced relationship within, within these two different powers. You cannot just ignore Russia, uh, which, which is, you know, exists and has impact on, 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 on the Arabian Peninsula, if you want. You cannot ignore uh, China. Uh, but also, uh, I think the U.S. continues to be the number one, let's say, uh, uh, shareholder within within this, uh, you know, conglomerate of, of uh, GCC U.S. Uh, shared interest in the region. However, it's, it's, I would say my view is that the U.S. is sort of selling some of its shares, you know, and and, and turning this from you know a sort of a family-owned business into a shareholding company so it's floating its its shares outside and that doesn't mean it doesn't want everything but it wants others to take care and i don't think that this is something that would eventually maintain the relationship exactly the same way it used to be 25 years ago you know it will change things definitely and a lot of those changes since obama came in and he brought in his his uh, concept of, of burden sharing there has been more responsibility and with that a little bit more you know uh, area of, of of maneuverability given uh, to the region and of course that extends the 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 you know what you call the trial and error type of of, of uh, approach so there are things that we've done right there are things that we've done wrong we've learned from both of them and i think what we see is an accumulation of, of that now is the us going on in the same direction is this something that would lead you know this is a sort of a split and as time passes there will be less and less of the us or not i think this will have to do more on the us rather than on on the gcc from my from what i see the gcc wants the us to be engaged continued but what we also see from let's say the recent visit of president macron to to the region is that not only china and and and, and russia who's trying to quote unquote fill the void not only iran and turkey who are also trying to fill the void also european countries are looking at that and trying to see where does that create some sort of an, an uh, you know a, a problem but as far as china is considered China is an important uh, trade partner for all of the countries in the region, including okay. Iran. And I okay. think they're trying to play a bigger role within Iran. This could become actually a positive factor rather than a negative factor. If, if, if you're going to align people based on a certain you know, uh, national interest and right. align those national interests within, within something like the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, Gulf countries cannot allow uh, Iran to have an exclusive relationship with China. They, they have to have their own relationship. So given the, the deep depth and maturity of Iran's relationship with China, that becomes a necessary uh, policy goal. Hassan, what do you think about, about the trajectory of uh, relations between uh, Gulf countries and the U.S., and, and particularly with an eye to, to the Chinese as well? Yeah, I, I agree with, with a lot of what uh, Mohammed has said. I mean, I think the Gulf states really, really, really would like, uh, uh, you know, for the U.S. to continue to play uh, the traditional role of, of security guarantor and so on. I think they just simply don't believe that it's, uh, uh, that it's willing to play that role uh, anymore. Um, and so the question is, uh, I think for the Gulf states, the key priority will be to navigate a soft landing. Uh, wean themselves, you know, gradually uh, away from uh, uh, dependence on, on the U.S., uh, manage and smooth out, uh, uh, try to shape the U.S.'s gradual but uh, certain disengagement from the region. Uh, um, but I think, and I think there will, you know, one, one of the key challenges, I think, ahead of the of U.S. Gulf relations is 
on the one hand, and we're already seeing that, especially with countries that have advanced economic and, and, and even more than economic relations with China, such as the UAE, uh, you know, the need to, to, to manage the tension that's resulting from uh, um, uh, the Gulf states' perceived need to build a wider set of, of economic and strategic uh, partnerships, including with the U.S.'s uh, great power competitors or, or near-peer near peer, uh, rivals. That's not to say that there aren't going to be any areas of convergence. I mean, obviously, uh, oil prices, the oil market remains uh, an international uh, you know, oil prices are, are and oil markets are very much international. Uh, the, uh, the U.S.'s uh, uh, allies in the, in the Indo-Pacific still rely on Gulf oil, and obviously. So there is a strategic uh, element there, uh, relations with Israel containing a, a potentially nuclear Iran and so on and so forth. Yeah. I think the biggest challenge really by far is going to be how the, the Gulf states in the U.S. manage their relations as the Gulf states attempt to respond and resolve the strategic predicament that I've attempted to, to describe. Yeah. In other words, uh, uh, how do the Gulf states uh, resolve and address some of these key asym asymmetries uh, in their relations with their regional rivals, especially Europe, at the time when the US is disengaging and the UN, US security role in the region is receding? One option, and I think one, 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 one Gulf response will be to pursue a, a strategy of hedging. Uh, and that means uh, building a wider set of relations, as we said, including with US competitors, but not exclusively. Uh, but I think the, the, the real potential for uh, um, a proliferation of missile technology, for example, in the Gulf, hmm. is something that, that, that is going to be, uh, I think, very tricky for the US yeah. Uh, uh, and the Gulf states to manage in their bilateral relations. And in, in a, a post-JCPOA, in a non-JCPOA world, right. let's say, where, where, where you, know, you have an Iran that's on the nuclear threshold or that, that actually breaks out, uh, how does the, the U.S. manage uh, the, er, the, the need, the perceived need by the Arab Gulf states uh, to, to engage in nuclear proliferation as well? Right. And so I think... Uh, my sort of, if I were to be in a, uh, if I were to provide a policy recommendation, uh, the, the the recommendation would be, uh, I think, for the U.S. to 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 attempt to shape the, the the Gulf states' responses to their strategic predicament. And so, something like, uh, and this is a something that you know we we think about here. Uh, the broader topic of controlled proliferation is something that. Uh, of, of missile technology specifically, something that my WIWS colleagues think think and write about. But yeah. it's something to consider as a parallel to the South Korean situation, right. where the U.S. allowed South Korea to acquire gradually uh, greater missile capabilities, especially short-range missile capabilities, in order to be able to deter North Korea. So the point is that I think if the U.S. doesn't uh, uh, attempt to shape those responses, doesn't provide a way out, then attempting to 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 then, then the question of how the Gulf states. Uh, uh, attempt to respond to their own and resolve their own strategic predicament in the U.S. becomes a source of, of great challenge in, in these relationships. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we're just about out of time, but I want to do one final thing, a lightning round. Uh, one sentence from each of you. What will you be watching in the next 12 months? What should people uh, pay attention to in the coming 12 months? Uh, from your point of view, Ali, you go first. I'm interested in seeing if the U.S. government recognizes that the GCC states are frontline states mm. in confrontation with Iran. And if the U.S. government is clever enough to understand that because these states are frontline states, they should also have greater ability to maneuver and in their dealings with, with, with Iran, uh, okay. but also in the grander scheme of things, uh, there are many winnings between the U.S. and China, which is uh, the largest customer of, of, of the Persian Gulf War. Okay, excellent. Sanam? Um, three things. I yeah. would be watching, of course, the JCPOA and uh, how that is managed um, and, and uh, you know, what sort of processes might come into place um, yeah. with or without the JCPOA. Two, um, the war in Yemen. I think yeah. the outcome there with the Marib campaign underway um, is going to be hugely decisive. Uh, for regional de-escalation, uh, for Saudi-Iranian dialogue. And it's, I think, very important in that space 
for um, uh, us to be discussing that now and not waiting um, or hoping that um, an outcome uh, might be different than what you already indicated at the beginning of, of this panel. And thirdly, um, the, the space of the Abraham Accords, there is a lot of momentum to build on the Abraham Accords. How is that going to evolve? And is that a dynamic uh, that um, offers a, a broader security um, cover uh, for, for those that join? Um, or, you know, what is, uh, what is the pathway uh, for that relationship beyond the economic and commercial ones um, that are very clearly being taunted, touted? So Great. Okay. Hassan, what should we watch? One thing, please. Um, I think I'll, I'll personally be uh, uh, watching the uh, how the Gulf states cope over the next uh, uh, few months, in the sense, uh, how do they adapt and, and change and reevaluate their strategies? Does the does Saudi Arabia manage to exercise leadership and unify the Gulf bloc? Does the UAE's hedging strategy uh, pay off? Does Bahrain's strategy of roping in Israel does that work? And, and to what extent can the rest of the Arab Gulf states? managed to appease Iran while respond to Saudi Arabia's demands for greater unity in the face of the Iranian uh, threat. Terrific. Uh, Mohammed, you're going to get the last word. What will you be watching? What should our audience be watching? I'll be watching the track two space. I think it's far more important now and possibly uh, uh, rewarding to, to watch, especially on issues of uh, regional security and cooperation. I think mm -hmm. that's where the big buck is. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're only two minutes over time, which is great. This has been a fantastic conversation, really. It, it was an almost impossibly big topic that we uh, took on, but I think a, a tremendous lot of interesting ideas. So what a great panel. So I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. It's been an honor. And I'd like to say to the audience, thank you. And please check the uh, website of the forum uh, for further details of the UAE Security Forum, and that's uh, uaesf.org, uaesf.org for the rest of our schedule for this security conference that we're doing right now, our annual UAE security conference. So thank you all very much. And uh, I hope to have all of you back on another panel in the near future. Thank you very much.